that? Okay. Yeah, there you go. You just put that in your pocket. Uh, you can clip on anyway. So. Just, uh, I'm going to put it because I have no pocket. Yes, <laughs> like this. I promise I won't damage it. That's fine. <laughs> I think it's okay. Press the button on it when, when it's a green light. It's on. So oh, it's okay, on good. <laughs> okay. Mine's on. Yes. Mine is I can. What do I do to turn it on? What did you do um, to turn it on? Oh, there. Here. There. Yeah. That's it. All right. Great. So, who wants to start? I can start. Or you start. can start. You can start. Yeah. Okay. You start then. Yeah. Good. That's your choose it between you. Yes. Okay. Yes. We already. <laughs> there you go. Well, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Let's sit down. I'll sit in the middle. Thank you. Keep you apart. <laughs> So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much um, for coming. Um, we are here to discuss the Colombian peace deal. Um, we are uh, one man down from our panel. Joaquin Villalobos, unfortunately, is ill um, and emailed this morning to send his uh, great regrets. Um, since he lives in a village in Oxfordshire, not far away, he's not going to be able to escape forever. So I'll make sure that we get him in on another occasion, since I think this story and these issues are certainly here to run and run. Um, I have Juan David, your own Juan David uh, here on my left, and Diana Daher, Daher, formerly of Blavatnik, um, uh, as our panel. Um, and uh, we're going to start with Juan David. I would just simply to frame the issue say, as you've all known, that uh, this is a peace deal after, of, after um, uh, an incredibly long uh, conflict, or at least um, lack of, uh, of uh, governmental control over uh, large parts of, uh, of a substantial major country. Uh, it is um, a peace deal that's taken, um, I think, six years of negotiation two years of talks about talks, followed by four years, am I right? Yes. Yeah. Um, of negotiations in Havana to produce the deal um, with uh, the FARC. Um, and then the referendum on um, October the 2nd rejected the deal by a tiny margin, 50.2 against 49.8. It then just goes to show that um, failure in politics can be sweet since uh, President Santos then received the Nobel Peace Prize and has just been on a very, I'm sure, very congenial visit to London as a state, as a guest at Buckingham Palace. So it can't be all bad, but nevertheless, this was rather a major uh, blow, and in particular, um, the issue of the division in Colombian politics between the two presidents, Santos and Uribe, um, lies um, behind this, but also lessons in peace and reconciliation and the, the balancing of, uh, of peace and justice um, for uh, other countries around the world. So, enough from me. Over to you, Juan David. Well, Bill, thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting us to comment on the peace deal and the referendum that you've mentioned. I want to address the topic from the point of view of the framing of the debate and how the framing of the debate will affect the future and what lessons can we draw from that framing for any other country that wishes to engage in this kind of direct participation instruments. And to give you a first idea of the framing of the debate, Many economists in Colombia have tried to find what variables 
could have predicted the results. And they have tried everything. The rural and the urban divide, the regions that were more affected by the conflict, you name the variable. And the best predictor of the results was the previous election. Is that terribly surprising? No, it's not really. The last election was the presidential election where President Juan Manuel Santos faced Oscar Iván Zuluaga, which is exactly the referendum debate between the yes camp and the no camp. And the referendum asked voters for a yes or a no, so it was polarizing the discussion by nature. And the framing of the debate was very close or very similar to the one that was presented in 2014 election between President Santos and uh, in one of the leaders of the no camp. So my first um, comment about referendums that's pertinent for Colombia, but for many other referendums, or all referendums perhaps, is that citizens are asked a specific question, but that doesn't mean that citizens answer that question. They may be answering actually something else. Uh, as one of my colleagues um, says several times, the people spoke, but what did people say? Well, they didn't answer about a 297-page peace agreement. They answered to some of the questions that were framed. And these questions were not just framed in the last month, let's say, of the campaign, but had been actually uh, created by the parties <laughs> since 2014 or, or even before. I'm going to interrupt with a quick further question because I would have used it afterwards, but I'll use it now. The turnout in the referendum. Um, as a non-expert on Colombia, it looks low. Um, and uh, you, uh, to have a referendum on such a fundamental issue about the future of your country ending a decades-long conflict that's killed so many people, for then people to speak by not going out to vote seems to me surprising. Was it surprising to you, or is that typical of uh, balloting in, in Colombia in recent, dec recent years? Well, if you <laughs> see the historical turnout, it's, uh, it's the, since voting is not uh, compelling, the turnout always ends up being between 40% 40, 40 and 50%. So it's ah, not very yeah. high. Yeah. But this time was lower than in previous occasions. That's what I thought. Uh, but you have to head that or qualify that statement because referenda are more volatile in terms of voter turnout in general in the world. Uh, so sometimes you get huge, massive participations. Had, in Brexit had a very Brexit, successful Brexit turnout. Brexit was higher example. than normal. The Scottish referendum so, was uh, considerably higher than normal. And then you have other cases such as Colombia, but then there's other even from Latin America, where ref referendums did not get the attention that we were expecting. And that's probably harder to explain that the no vote. But was, I suppose, was staying at home tantamount to voting no? Or would that be, would that divide? Well, I, I th it's, it's very difficult to, I mean, this is not an, strictly speaking, an academic event. So uh, maybe I can give away answers without uh, having the fear of uh, academia. But That's this fine. is a good topic for a PhD. I'm thesis. strictly speaking, not an academic either. So, <laughs> so th this is a very good topic for a PhD thesis. Yeah. Um, the, the question of why such a huge abstention. Uh, I don't think that the answer was n no. Instead, or that the people that didn't not vote were saying also no to the agreement. They're actually probably saying no to something else. Right. And it's the, probably not just the political system, but whether the, among, the agreements among political elites would mean anything in their daily life. 
And there's um, a one PhD student at Oxford who is currently in Colombia doing field work. And, and she posted a very interesting blog post about why uh, people abstained in, in the municipality where she was doing field work, which is a municipality historically affected by the conflict. So people have a stake in it. And, 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 and according to her interviews, people felt that whatever happened in Havana or in Bogota would not accept, affect their daily life. So violence for them and the kind of violence that affected them had a completely different uh, meaning. And, and, and for them, what the elites were doing were actually nothing responsive to their mm. needs. Shall I move on to Diana and uh, just ask, and then we'll come back to you, Juan David. Where is this going to go next? <laughs> well, um, I want to start uh, to answer that question by just adding two ideas uh, to what Juan just said about what could explain the voter turnout, because I cannot predict what could happen without explaining uh, or adding some ideas to what could have explained the election and the voter turnout. And I just want to pose two ideas, uh, inclusion and trust. And those two ideas are two sides of the same coin. So there is no trust without inclusion, and there is no inclusion without trust. And those two ideas are at the core of the referendum's result, because by some people that voted no, they did not felt included in the agreement, and they did not trust the people that built the agreement. And let me be a little bit more clear with this. When I speak about inclusion, I want to, to, be, to acknowledge the enormous effort that this took to President Santos and his team to build this agreement that it's outstanding in terms of what a peace agreement could be. Um, however, even though he tried to include some parts of the population, there is a half of the population that was the half that voted no, that did not feel represented in that particular agreement. And the way to include that people in the negotiation is not just to ask them at some point if they agree or not about what was agreed, but throughout the whole negotiation and throughout the whole peace process, not only to tell them what is being negotiated and if they agree, but, and this is a lesson also to what comes next, but to open up the space to hear them about what they have to say regarding what peace is for them. And this um, is relevant for inclusion because if, that, if those voices are not heard and if those people that feel that they are not represented there do not feel included in that agreement, chances are that they will vote no. And I go here with trust. And trust is a very difficult topic that could also go into a, into a PhD thesis. Um, but trust is at the core of the referendum's result because trust has been one of the biggest victims of Colombia's conflict. Um, it has been almost six decades of conflict where different sectors of society have been used to don't trust in each other. And when some sectors of society saw a peace agreement being negotiated by a president whose popularity is 20% and a guerrilla group whose popularity is even lower, chances are that they do not trust in that agreement that is presented to them. And during the, the six years that this whole process lasted, there were consistent uh, actions of the guerrilla group that did not help building that trust. So for instance, some, um, um, some interviews of the guerrilla group saying that they did not want to give arms away or that they are not going to give their, uh, their goods to repair the victims, or that they are not going to acknowledge that they committed uh, crimes or that they are going to uh, ask for forgiveness. Those things sum up and erode trust from the debate. And if you don't have trust and if you don't have inclusiveness, chances are that you have a recipe of disaster when you ask people if they approve or do not approve 
that agreement. And now moving to your question about what comes next. I'm highly positive about the results because um, if the voter uh, and, and vote will have been a slight majority for yes and no having 49, which will be the scenario if the yes, if yes will have won, the polarization and the lack of inclusiveness and trust of society in that agreement would not have been high. The polarization will have been huge and the success of the agreement will not have been as good as it would have been if all the sectors are included. So what, what's next? And here are some lessons that, that, that could be learned from the process. First, if you want to create an agreement that builds peace, you need to include all sectors from, of society since the beginning and include them, them in a meaningful way, in a way that they feel that they are represented in what's being negotiated. And including that is not only allowing them to build proposals and then commenting on the proposals, because as, as we learn in the, in the, in the Masters of, of Public Policy, as you're going to see in the class of negotiations, sometimes when you send some proposals that you want to discuss in an agreement, that doesn't mean that that's what actually you want to have in the agreement. It's just that you want to have a higher negotiation um, uh, uh, movement and, and ability to, to have your uh, positions included in the agreement. So basically inclusiveness is allowing them to present the proposals and at the same time giving them a space to speak and to feel that they are in an equal position as the other people that are building the agreement. And trust is something that also presents in a positive way um, now that we have this result because if more people are included now that no vote won, chances are that the people that felt represented with the other positions are going to trust more in the final agreement. And just to give you a little bit of context about why it's so important the inclusiveness and, and the trust for the agreement to succeed. This is an agreement that at the core of the whole agreements of the almost 300 pages uh, had the word participation. So participation was um, around 400 times during the agreement, which means that a key issue for the agreements to succeed was to have citizen participation in all the different mechanisms that were later going to bring life to the different agreements negotiated. So if there's no trust about what's there, people is not going to participate to make, it, uh, to, to, to make it true. And next then, what, what should come next is to open up the spaces for people to feel that they trust in what's being negotiated because they feel included in it. Thank you. And um, so we have this um, situation of this, uh, uh, this lack of inclusion, obviously lack of communication as well, that um, and indeed a very fast move from signing, at least formally signing the peace deal to the referendum, very quick thereafter, so not a long communication period for a start, which was, is surprising as an outsider. But then, overlaid on this trust issue, you have the division between Uribe and uh, Juan Manuel Santos, so predecessor and successor. Um, and President uh, Uribe has produced a set of proposals, I understand, since the rejection of the referendum. Um, uh, in, in particular, uh, proposals adjusting the way in which um, FARC commanders or FARC uh, fighters um, are treated after, uh, after the, um, the um, deal, if they confess to war crimes, he's proposing that if they confess to war crimes, they should, as before, not go to prison, but nevertheless be confined and not um, be allowed to uh, have a seat in Congress eventually uh, and for that, that process to be guarded by the Supreme Court and not, the special, not a special tribunal. So these, this is, if you like, a set of kind of specific proposals. How do you, what does one relate that to the citizen participation issue? Uh, is Uribe the voice of the people? Or 
how, how will the, the inclusion process be preceded from now on? Juan, and then we'll get back to Diana. Well, President Santos has received different stakeholders from the no camp. And maybe that's actually a very intelligent move because he uh, take the fo took the focus from Uribe to a larger group. Because clearly, if Uribe was the most prominent figure in the no camp, but then um, to give you an example of the framing that I was mentioning before, uh, the Protestant churches played a big role mobilizing people for the no vote. Because part of the framing that was created by the no camp was that the agreement would entail greater progress for, for example, LGBTI groups, which they oppose. Um, and, and some, let's say, pastors from the Protestant church in Colombia have been uh, meeting with Santos and they had their own proposals. So even though Uribe perhaps is the most salient voice of the no camp, there's clearly other actors who have different agendas. Uribe was very smart because he was able to coordinate the agendas into a specific objective that was the no vote. Citizen participation certainly has been uh, vibrant in the last month because we've seen rallies in hundreds of cities. People that voted yes, some of them that voted no, even probably someone that didn't vote saying, look, okay, October 2 passed, but what's true is that we all want uh, an end to a conflict that uh, prevents further deaths. So leaders from the yes, leaders from the no, please continue the negotiation and bring a new formula. And the proposals from the no camp, I'm including the ones from Uribe, are, are not terribly different from what the agreement already stated. And that's, of course, surprising. But then th there's a very important and key issue that Uribe is asking and that probably will not go forward. And it's that he asks for a completely different treatment between the leaders of the FARC and the rank and file. Yep with absolute generosity for the rank and file and harsher conditions for the leadership. And even the FARC has, have said, well, you know, that's a trick. You are just trying to destabilize our movement, our group. And, and, go in, and, and, and I want to link that with the question of what comes next. And the, the truth is that time is running against the peace agreement. Because FARC leaders have been seeing how their monolithic organization, their four decades long monolithic organization, is starting to show cracks. It's some specific units have defected or with even resources from FARC. Some say that they simply don't agree and that they will continue to fight even if their leaders agree something with the government. And this is probably the, the first time that the FARC commanders are, are seeing how their organization is, is not um, a, a, a command and control organization. And I'm, I'm sure that they're quite worried. And if you read any guerrilla handbook of guerrilla warfare, you'll see that they follow this advice, and it's that a guerrilla that does not fight ceases to be a guerrilla. And they know that they need to carry on if they want to subsist as an organization. And, and that's why they need a solution soon. Well, the other aspect of that, which uh, just as my final question, then I want to bring uh, everyone else in, um, to, to you, Diana. Now, as, you, as one looks at this conceptually, as with all such conflicts, there's a kind of, during the conflict, there's often a, a kind of line between do you call people, well, not in this case, but in other cases, freedom fighter versus terrorist in, in certain circumstances, um, ideological guerrilla versus um, uh, um, people with some other motivation. 
But then also, as it becomes reconciled, as we found certainly in Northern Ireland, um, there's the issue of essentially organized crime versus um, guerrilla or, or any kind of ideological force. And one of the things that can slow the process or, or, or complicate the process of reconciliation is the fact that there's strong economic interests of some groups, as Juan is implying, in maintaining control, which is essentially an analogous control to an organized crime organization. How do you see that in the Colombian context now as, as the process of, de of uh, like um, demobilizing the FARC goes through and how do you think it's being dealt with in the right way? Well, you have posed a huge challenge that was there seconds. even before <laughs> it was there even before the, the agreement was launched. And it's, it's a huge challenge that is persistent for every kind of peace process, which uh, is that if there are certain resources that are at stake, chances are that there's people that will not like to leave that source of having their own resources and want to keep fighting. And this actually happened in Colombia during the, the mobilization of the paramilitary groups. Um, ten years ago in Colombia, um, a peace process um, was launched with uh, paramilitary groups and when they demobilized, they left a vacuum of power. And uh, the, because they, they controlled some part of the business of drug dealing. And after the, they demobilized, some of the people that were part of the movement just didn't want to demobilize because they didn't have better conditions outside uh, that scenario, so they kept on having the, the drug dealing business. And other people uh, saw this as an opportunity to have better resources. So chances are that this could happen in Colombia after the demobilization of uh, far guerrillas. And there are other current guerrillas that might um, get better off due to this, like ELN groups. Uh, what could be done in order to, let's say, avoid being a huge word because this is something that is a, a huge risk, the situation. First, there is a need to have more presence of the state and, and have more institutionality and more institutions, build institutional capacity in the places of Colombia where the, cons where the conflict has been more per persistent and where these situations uh, are happening. Um, so uh, just to give you a, a little bit of context about Colombia, Colombia doesn't have the same institutional capacity throughout all the country. And this is something that creates a very good uh, scenario for, the, for these uh, illegal groups to have their own business, their illegal business in those areas. So first, you need to build institutional capacity in order to have more arm, uh, legal armed forces. So, so basically, uh, police and military having control over the zone. But at the same time, this is not only about having security control of the territory. It's also important to build institutions in the way of creating judges, creating places where people can go, and as for certain demands, like having their services fulfilled and having roads in those parts of the territory. So it's basically about creating opportunities for people that live there. So if those economic opportunities and those legal institutions are there, chances are that people don't go to the illegal group to have their resources fulfilled, but that they join the legal economic position. And if legal institutions are there, to, 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 to satisfy the rule of law in that area of the territory, chances are that the population that live there are not going to go to the um, uh, chief of the illegal group to ask about uh, what he or she should do about this problem, but that person will go to the legal institution of the state. And there are very useful um, research right now in Colombia that shows how how, how different the institutional presence 
is between the different municipalities of Colombia. So if you want to avoid that illegal business, it's important to fight it in the security way, but it's even more important to fighting building more opportunities for people because these are areas of Colombia, of the territory, where people are used to uh, uh, following the rules of those guerrilla members that control those zones or of the uh, gangs that control those places. And, and you cannot replace that just with force. You need to win the trust of the population. And winning that trust implies building all those services that the illegal groups were used to fulfill. And these are places where these groups are the ones that build the roads, are the ones that uh, solve the problems, are the ones that bring, bring food. So you need to, again, build that trust and include those zones of the territory in the institutionality. So I have a credible plan. So really the, 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 the hard task starts once you even have an agreement. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's open up uh, to um, short, sharp contributions from here <laughs> at the back. There's a microphone whizzing around to you. I have two questions. The first one is why did the, the uh, FARC and Juan Manuel Santos insist to take the, the peace accords to a vote? This still dazzles me. And the second one is how, how political are the, the FARC really? And if they reach a peace accord, would Colombia switch to a military uh, strategy more like the one in Mexico? I mean, because FARC, their, their economic income is mainly from drugs. And I don't know to what extent is the FARC politicized. I mean, they have a political arm. Yeah. But to what extent is that true? Good question. We'll take a couple more, so, uh, rather than having answering uh, one by one as before. Um, where was another? Oh, yeah. Over here, Anna. One of the key issues in the agreement was uh, the agrarian subject, you know and the agrarian reform. What would you think would be the state's capacity to enforce this agreement in the agrarian reform sense, uh, given that you have said that uh, Colombian government uh, doesn't, have, doesn't even have presence in all of its territory? Good. Over maybe here. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, the panel, what do you think the government could do better in um, communicating clearly the relevance of the agreement for the people? Because as um, Juan David was mentioning, apparently there was um, uh, no turnout in certain areas where they feel this really doesn't affect them because they have other sources of violence that are not directly linked to the conflict with FARC. <coughs> and um, as Diana was saying, uh, the guerrilla has such a low popularity that people probably are not interested in having an agreement with them. So while I agree that everyone wants peace, I don't think that everyone wants a negotiated peace. I mean, that's sad, but it's kind of reality. Um, so what do you think uh, the government could do in terms of communicating the relevance of the agreement for everyone? Because uh, it seems to me that is not very clear for, for, for the people. OK, quick answers. Um, Juan, uh, was it a mistake to put this to a vote? Just impose it. Well, the thing is that, as Diana suggested in the beginning, President Santos lacked trust from a significant portion of society. Yeah. So, uh, so since the first day when the negotiation uh, was, became public, both Farc and him explicitly claimed that the result would be um, would be, a, I mean, he did not promise a vote, but he promised that people, people would have a, a take on that result. And putting it in, into a vote was something decided just a few months before the referendum was organized. So more or less, everything was a bit improvised in that sense. Everything, as you said, was very quick. And that's actually one of the answers for Catalina, and it's that, well, the government should have taken more time to work engaging people into the process, not just communicating, but actually yeah. engaging people. So I'm, I'm going to leave that because I have more answers, but 
Okay. Maybe Diana wants Maybe something just else to a say. a bit on agrarian reform, and because um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically the topic that you were finishing with. <laughs> yeah. Um, what? What? what how, real, how can you make land reform and rural development real to build people's trust in this? Um, I don't want to be that repetitive, but the issue of inclusiveness, it's very important uh, for the agrarian reform uh, point. Um, there's a precedent in Colombia of a law that intended to, to do a little bit of rural reform, which is the law on victims and um, land restitution, which basically uh, intended to restitute land to displaced population in Colombia. And there has been many challenges for the implementation of that, land, uh, of, of that law, because new armed groups have emerged opposing that restitution. Groups that are, can, can, can be uh, seen as former paramilitary groups. So these are particular economic and, and social interests that are behind that land restitution that if are not inclu included in a way that is successful since the beginning of the negotiations and if consensus are not built around rural development, it's going to be very difficult to implement that reform. And I'm not being naive. I know that it's very difficult to create consensus around rural development in Colombia. But this is why it's so important to try to do it. Because chances are that if you don't do it, new uh, armed groups are going to emerge to oppose that. And then more conflict will be around. So, so the first thing that needs to be done is to acknowledge that there's a problem and that, it, this, that it's as important to create a solution for people that have been displaced or for people <coughs> that do not have opportunities in their, in their territories as is important to include in that negotiation the people that have won from that situation. And here there are very huge interests at the stake of companies that have their businesses in the land that was previously uh, owned by the, by the displaced population. So these are very tricky issues, but ignoring the problem is not going to make it better. And then I'm going to go back to, Ka to Catalina's question about the, co the communication. It's as important communication as hearing the people, and this is something that we're not very used to in the government. <laughs> um, the way that, that the, I'm going back to framing, the way that the whole discussion around, discussion around the agreement has been framed is about the government doing education about the agreement and educating people, and the word in Spanish is pedagogía, like educating people around the agreement, which is important. It's important to inform the population about what the agreement says. However, as important as communicating that agreement is, is to hearing the views of the population and hearing them in a way that they feel that they are being heard. So hearing them is not opening a space or a box or a platform in, in, the, in the internet where people can upload their, their, their petitions or where people can put what they say, think about the agreement. Hearing people is actually taking the time to sit with them and to hear what their worries are and then to try in the agreement to, in certain way, include measures to fulfill those worries. It's difficult. But peace is a process. Peace is not something that you have in a paper and now we have. It's a process that needs this kind of hearing and dialogue and not only communicating the final agreements. So let's get another um, round of input over here. Yeah, um, in the front. Yep, uh, Joanna. Um, how would you comment on what the government could do in the future to address the question of impunity because it seems that it, there is a big trade-off in reaching a peace agreement and giving up some of the, um, 
there are certain groups uh, in, in Colombia, I think, that uh, still feel that impunity, and it will probably be a persistent um, issue, whatever deal might be reached. So what are your views on uh, the trade-off of reaching a peace agreement and giving up some of the um, potential um, legal charges to people that committed crime? Okay, and how yeah. eager would be the guerrilla groups to give up? Very fundamental question. One, yeah, first immediately behind and then... Uh, I'm actually going to write my dissertation about abstentionism, uh, particularly with the referendums. I'm glad you said that would be an interesting topic. Um, I was wondering what you... Because, uh, I mean, not all abstention in this, in this referendum was conscious. There were a huge number of people. There were five or six million Colombians living abroad who couldn't vote for whatever reason. Uh, and the, just the, the logistics interest me quite a lot. Um, and I was wondering why the government gave, uh, put the, the step in place where to vote in this referendum, I, as, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you had to vote where you'd voted in the 2014 presidential election. A lot of people in, those two, in these two years don't live anywhere near that, that, um, that polling station anymore. Uh, there's a huge amount of internal displacement as well in Colombia, um, which I think accounts for quite a lot of the abstention figure. I was wondering why this step, and then was it a complacency issue? Because I think before the before the referendum, nobody really gave the no vote that much of a chance from the from the polls I saw. Were they assuming they were going to win regardless of abstention, which obviously turned out to be by far the biggest step? So I was wondering if you could expand on that slightly. Okay, let's to, to your left. Yeah. Hi. So the ELN and the government are going to sit down to talk soon. And I was kind of wondering what you think um, kind of the result of this referendum and the fact that the government is going to have to renegotiate this piece with the FARC, how that's going to influence the talks with the ELN and kind of what that interaction is going to be like to have those two processes going on at the same time. Another qu question in the front here. <coughs> American Center down the road. Um, sadly, land reform in Colombia in the last 50 years has a track record of not winning votes in Congress and the Senate. So I would like to address uh, Diana's comment and just perhaps suggest that there's a mismatch between those that advocate land reform and political groups, right-wing political groups, who have a specific agenda in containing land reform. And the net result is uh, low election turnout in land reform areas and specific interest within Congress and the Senate to contain land reform. And the drama of uh, land reform recently has basically brought to light the difficulty between advocated rights, civil rights, uh, judici access to the judiciary uh, of inhabitants that claim for land reform, and the possibility of passing those in Congress. So I see a point of conflict there, and I'll just appreciate the, your thoughts on that. Very interesting. Any, was one more question anywhere? Oh, okay, well, final question, and then we'll have final answers. Hello. Um, I wanted to know that what are a few lessons you want countries who are in the process of making deal in their, with their, with the anti-government groups in their own countries, what are the few lessons you want them to learn from Colombian peace deal? Very good. Okay, brief, brisk answers because I we're running over time, unfortunately. So we'll be thrown out. Um, well, I want to address the abstention question. Yes. The trend of the voting yeah. abroad for Colombians is very pro-Uribe. So he has won in the last three elections abroad, if you just take into account the votes from mm -hmm. abroad. Was that the reason why the government did not organize properly a voting abroad? We I won't answer that. We couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> exactly, I won't answer <laughs> that. Um, and certainly I think there was some degree of complacency in general to participate, to, for the government to um, promote participation. Um, th there's uh, an anecdote that I wanted to share that was uh, published in a political blog 
uh, very mainstream blog, where politicians from the north of Colombia that are very well known for their political distribution of resources for distributive politics, they're very uh, good at it and they mobilize thousands of people. They said, well, you know, the government did send some resources, uh, and, but it was, not, it, it was just enough to pay for the transport of the people. But, you know, we, we needed a bit more. Mm -hmm. And the abstention in the north of the country was in very, very big, absolutely uh, different to what you see in regular elections. So that tells you also a, a, something about a quality of, of the politics in Colombia, at least in that north area where probably non-programmatic distribution of resources is more, about, is more important for voting turnout than other issues. Um, and then I have more answers, but I'll leave Diana and then if I have more time, I'll give my take. That's a dangerous thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> impunity. So the, the, the fundamental tra trade-off of truth and justice, or yes. peace and justice, rather. Um, how, uh, how does it come out in this and what, what can be done on that? Well, actually the agreement had a very good formula uh, for, for the whole transitional justice issue in the way that it did not rely solely <coughs> on um, a criminal proceeding against FARC, but it tried to implement different kinds of uh, solutions to fulfill and satisfy the rights of the victims to through justice negotiation and non-recurrence. So on one hand, it created a jurisdiction, a, a, a peace jurisdiction, um, just um, to, 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 trial, to, to put into trial certain particular crimes, the most, uh, let's call it the, the most heinous crimes. On the other hand, it created other kind of, uh, of, of mechanisms to satisfy the rights of the victims. So, for instance, it created a, um, an agency just in <coughs> charge of searching the, the bodies of disappeared people, which is very important for a victim, not only to having um, a final ruling about what happened in the process, but also actually knowing where the, where, where the disappearing person is. It also created a threat commission, and it created lots of different guarantees to, for, for non-recurrence of the conflict. Among them, the land reform. Because the, the whole agreement recognized that the whole, just relying on justice is not going to be enough to first um, try to, to, to satisfy the rights of the victims, but on the other hand, guarantee that the conflict is not, is not going to be repeated. Um, so in, the, in, in, that, in that sense, uh, the creation of a whole system for, to guarantee the different rights of the victims is better than creating a formula of truth versus uh, justice. It just uh, acknowledges that creating, satisfying all those rights is highly complex and since there are certain lessons learned from previous experiences in Colombia just relying on criminal proceedings, like the former process with the, uh, with the militaries. The, the, the formula of having different mechanisms to satisfy the different rights of the victims, it's a good formula. It creates some challenges, like how to coordinate the different mechanisms. And for instance, what happens if there are certain um, things that are said in the third commission if that's going to affect the jurisdiction of peace. But that's another problem. So I think that, that the idea of dividing uh, the, the, the different functions that need to be fulfilled in order to have uh, justice, truth, reparation, and non-recurrence is a very good idea. And then here I just want to acknowledge the, the, um, the question about the land reform. Mm. Uh, it's a very, it's a f fair point. It's, it's absolutely right. There are very um, rough agendas against land reform. And at some point, I, I think that there's going to be an incompatibility of interests, and that's something that just needs to be acknowledged. And at some point, no consensus could be, could be had. However, that doesn't mean that a consensus could 
we try to, attend, to, 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 to have it with certain parts of the different sectors that are interested. So just trying is different from not doing anything <laughs> in a way, but, but I do agree with you, it's a highly complex um, issue that it's at the core of the conflict. It's one of the causes of the conflict, so it's one of the biggest issues to address. But that's why um, it's so important in order to <coughs> guarantee that no new conflicts emerge from that, at least to try to build a consensus around it. But so I must bring, bring it to a close, so I'm going to ask you both to answer with uh, two bullet points each. For like <laughs> that's the right word, since I suppose the signature was a uh, pen was a was a was a bullet, so I can I'm allowed to use the word bullet the phrase bullet point. Um, the so lessons for uh, other mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Top two from you and top two from you, and, and then we'll have to finish. Just a parenthesis. I ha I'm not very optimistic about ELN because that was a question over there. I yeah. I don't see that there will be significant progress. Of course, if I have some optimism for bias, then it would be better to have both FARC and ELN in, on board, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, now my two top uh, lessons. Uh, first, we have to think very well what we need referendums for. So it's not that we don't have referendums. They, they may be quite useful, but what type of questions do we want to ask? Because okay. they don't seem very good for um, long-term policy making or for topics that are very polarizing and that could actually harm democracy. And, um, and, and secondly, there, it, maybe it was clearer in Brexit, but in this case, it seems that there's a slight generational divide. And, and uh, if democracy is taking decisions by the majority, but the ones affected are those that will live in the future and not those that are voting now, or not the majority that's voting now for some um, the issue, then we also have to think about the um, intergenerational aspects of, of democracy and how we are using majority to vote on some things that will affect future generations. Very quick. <laughs> well, although I don't, I don't think that there is a silver bullet <laughs> for no. peace building, I'm going to try to pose just two ideas, and, and they are very broad. But um, I think they are at the core of what happened in Colombia. First, peace requires a lot of humbleness and humility uh, from all the different sectors of society. Um, when you have a conflict, you have lots of different sectors that have been fighting for a long time and that have committed terrible things between each other. And to sit with them, to negotiate, requires, in a way, to, to be humble and, and, and to, to acknowledge that the other is, in a certain way, equal to you and that it's as important for you to speak as to hear the other. Uh, so humbleness is something that is at the core actually, of, of like including people and building trust. Okay, the second one. And the second one is having patience. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, it's serious. It's having patience. And, and, and building peace, it's a huge process. It, it takes a long time. So you need to be patient about it and, and to acknowledge that things like the referendum's results are going to happen. And that's just part of the process. And peace is a process. So we need to be patient about that. And <laughs> OK. And then the principle of moderation is gratitude. So I yes. thank both of you for a uh, uh, wonderful presentation. I suspect we'll come back to this issue. What's for sure is that at the next, um, what's in the new session next week, we will have the American election result. Um, wow. <laughs> God help us. Um, yes. <laughs> and um, that will be, the format for that will be, I will give a presentation on the results um, very briskly, and then we'll have a panel of, uh, of MPP students from the different regions of the world 
to discuss what does this mean for um, our regions. And then a week later, we will have um, an evening uh, session on a longer-term view of the U.S. election. So can't escape. Um, thank you very much again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Bill. It thank was you. Great. Wonderful. To be part of this. Uh, thank you for so much for, for taking part. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, let's see how it, it how ends. It works. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It'll keep going. It will keep going. Okay.